Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ave Maria Press Professional Development Webinar Series. In today's webinar, Paul Jarzembowski will reflect on how we can apply the field hospital model of the church to our ministry with young adults. My name is Erin Pierce. I am the Parish and Curriculum Marketing Specialist at Ave Maria Press. I would like to recognize our webinar partners, the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association of Catholic Family Life Ministers, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the Catholic Campus Ministry Association. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions. Questions may be sent to our presenter using the question section of the GoToWebinar panel that you see here, and I'll read as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation today. The webinar is being recorded, and I will send you an email tomorrow with a link to that recording. With that, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter today. Since 2013, Paul Jarzembowski has served on staff at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in Washington, D.C., leading the USCCB's efforts for youth and young adults. In this role, he is also the National Coordinator for World Youth Day for the United States. Originally from the Diocese of Gary in Indiana, and having worked in parish, college, campus, uh, and diocesan ministries in the Archdiocese of Chicago and the Diocese of Joliet, Paul has spoken at, written for, and consulted with hundreds of local and diocesan communities, national organizations, and conferences across the U.S., Canada, the Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, and the Vatican. Paul is a history buff and an avid fan of movies, baseballs, baseball, and Disney. He and his wife, Sarah, live in the Maryland suburbs of Washington, D.C. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. Good to be with you. Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and turn the presenter mode over to you. Excellent. And there we go. Awesome. All right, I'll go ahead and close out and come back when you're done. Fantastic. It's good to be with everybody today. Um, so yeah, our, our conversation today is going to be on uh, pastoral care and accompaniment with young adults through the image of mobilizing the field hospital. Um, uh, it perhaps is a very uh, apt metaphor of what we're experiencing right now. Um, uh, the, the notion of being a hospital um, is perhaps more, um, more uh, important now than perhaps we ever even considered it. So um, one of the things that uh, Pope Francis has told us is that the times are changing. And this was written, Pope Francis said this before COVID hit, before 2020 hit. Uh, he, he wrote this last year. Um, and uh, it, it, it's very, it's become very true to us. Uh, it leads us to ask, what are today's young adults really like and what is going on in their lives? Um, and so I want to first paint a picture of, uh, of some of the young adults uh, that we're going to be talking about. Um, and, uh, and again, just for reference to uh, when we speak about young adults, uh, we're speaking about those in their 20s and 30s um, primarily, uh, often, sometimes in their late teens as well in college, uh, young professionals, um, those who are singles, those who are young couples. Um, so that's, the, that's who I'm talking about when I'm think, talking about young adults. Um, but what is going on with them? And, and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about in this here. Um, very, very relevant to right now. Um, one of the things that we're knowing is that um, young adults are themselves not just sitting on the sidelines uh, right now. Um, they are, as we've heard recently, um, uh, especially with recent trends, that young adults are indeed part of this COVID-19 coronavirus infection story. Um, they're not, you know, I think initially when we had, we learned about it, uh, young adults were kind of on the side uh, watching and it was primarily something that we focused on uh, with a more senior population. But as we've seen, uh, COVID-19 really uh, does not discriminate on age now. It really is truly across, uh, and young adults are, uh, are indeed vulnerable to that. Um, and so, uh, we're seeing that many of the young adults who are on the front lines, many of those are those who have, 
are experiencing that. Uh, I bring that up because I think that when we think about young adults and we think about church, we don't often think about them being the ones that are, who are indeed in the, literally in the hospital, um, but they are indeed uh, struggling through this. Um, but then there's other, other factors as well. Um, one of the things that we have discovered in the midst of this pandemic is that some young people are fearing social isolation more than COVID-19. So this is something that, um, that if they themselves are not impacted directly by, uh, by the virus, uh, they are certainly impacted by the um, measures that are taken to prevent the spread of the virus, which is the, the, the stay at home, the work from home, the quarantine, uh, the social distancing. Um, one of the things that um, we've also learned is that um, that loneliness and social isolation were a, were a major factor with young people even before COVID-19. So you tell a generation of, of young people, of young adults, um, who are struggling with a crisis of loneliness like never before, uh, telling them, now I need you to, uh, to not be around others. Um, it certainly amplifies that reality. Um, it, it, it deepens it. Um, it. It makes it even go even. It, it's a harder hit thing. So this is one of the things that is definitely going on in their lives. Um, contrary to perhaps what people might see uh, or, or even imagine what is going on with young adults right now, um, this is something that is that is there. Um, another aspect is the economic impact. Um, one of the things that in this particular article um, we read that it's the younger generations, millennials and Gen Z, who will likely bear the greatest financial brunt of the economic impact for from COVID-19. Um, many millennials, as it says, entered the workforce that hadn't recovered from a 2008 recession, and now they're getting hit hard again. So um, economically, they're they are significantly impacted. Um, the other thing that we're noticing too is that this also is impacting uh, young young adults, um, especially from those who economically uh, are already struggling. So those in poorer communities, uh, those who um, do not have college degrees, uh, those from many culturally diverse backgrounds. Um, this is having a, a significant impact, economic impact on their lives, um, and that of course then leads to some of the issues brought before. It leads to some of the issues related to mental health um, because the, the, the fear and the anxiety related to the economy um, is certainly something that's impacting them. Um, I, we cannot get out of 2020 with also without talking about what is going on in their lives. Um, just if you look on the screen, you'll see um, the, the names and the ages of uh, some of the young adults who have been impacted by the reality of racial injustice. Brianna Taylor, age 26. Richard Brooks, age 27. Freddie Gray, 25. Philandro Castile, 32. Sandra Bland, 28. You see, and then Audrey, um, sorry, my screen went. Um, uh, you know, also age 25. So you see all these, and then what you, the other thing you also understand, uh, Ahmed Aub Aub Aubrey is 2025. You see that all of these realities are also impacting those who are protesting uh, the issues of social justice. Um, many of the uh, protesters who are coming out are themselves in their 20s and 30s. Uh, they are asking literally the question, am I next? And it's across racial lines. Many of the young people are the ones who are impacted by this reality the hardest. They, they're, they're struggling to understand it. So what is going on in their lives? This is, this is key. In um, last year, um, when Pope Francis released the document Christus Vivit, um, he was born out of a process that, um, that really began uh, with a synodal listening experience. Um, he listened to young people around the world. We in the United States listened to young people um, in this country. What were they going through? And here are some other things that we learned. What is going on in their lives? Marginalization and social exclusion. Questions concerning their identity, their, their sexual identity, uh, reciprocity between men and women, homosexuality. Those are things that are going on in their lives, those questions. 
um, what's going on in their lives, a highly digitized culture that has profound impact on their identity of time and space, self-understanding, the understanding of others, their relationships with others. What's going on in their lives? Uh, they're also experiencing movements of migration, um, especially those fleeing from war, violence, political or religious persecution, from natural disasters caused by climate change and from extreme poverty. So young people, young adults are very much on the move. Now, this is, and this is not just related to those who are uh, perhaps living on, in the, on the border areas of the United States. This is happening across the entire United States of all cultures, including white European American cultures. This movement of migration, young people in constant mobility, uncertain of where they're going to be next. Many don't make those long-term commitments for the very fact that they don't know in one year, in two year, in three year, if they're going to be in the same same place, the same apartment, the same city, the same state, the same country. They don't know. Um, there's constant movement. And then what's going on in their lives? Abuse in various forms. That is something that was heard through the synodal process that young people are suffering from the abuse of power, the abuse of conscience, sexual and financial abuse, the desire to dominate, the lack of dialogue and transparency, which has abusive effects and forms of a double, double life, spiritual emptiness and corruption on behalf of those in institutional leadership, including the church. These are things that are going on in their lives. Um, and so um, something early in, in Pope Francis's pontificate that really kind of um, kind of comes over me as I hear a lot of these things, as I reflect on what is going on right now, is that he said very early in his pontificate that the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. Um, you'll see some of the imagery actually in, in, my, in my slides here, really talking about uh, the field hospital. Um, and think about that field hospital. Um, perhaps those of a certain age might remember uh, a TV show uh, or even a movie uh, named after the uh, the Mobile Army uh, Surgical Hospital um, or MASH, um, which was itself a field hospital uh, set in the Korean War, um, just behind the battle lines as people came in, always ready. That is the image that Pope Francis offers uh, those of us in leadership in the church. That is the type of ministry with young adults that he is dreaming of. This is the type of things. And the synodal process that led up to Christus Vivit, which is the Pope's declaration on uh, our church's ministry with young people, was really couched in the notion that we need to be responsive. We need to be a field hospital. And so perhaps now more than ever, um, that is being tested. Um, that the, the reality is that young, young people are being impacted um, they, they were being impacted for many years before this. There was always things that were in their lives. But COVID-19, this economic recession, the fight for racial justice have amplified and reminded us of our call to be a field hospital. In Christus Vivit, Pope Francis says, may we, meaning we as church leaders, never fail to weep before these tragedies of our young. Young people experience setbacks, disappointments, and profoundly painful memories. So the church wants to be Jesus's instrument on the path to interior healing and peace of heart. So that is our framework. Um, there's a few areas that I think we can start to consider. These are some initial areas that I would like us, basically based on kind of some of the realities that we're facing, uh, based on some of the trends, the, 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 the trends that we're seeing with young adults today. These are areas of pastoral concern um, when we think about our pastoral care ministries in our parishes and our dioceses, uh, we often think about assisting the elderly, um, about those who are uh, terminally ill. Uh, we think about those individuals when we think of pastoral care. We don't often think of the 23-year-old or the 31-year-old. Uh, we don't think about that individual when we think about pastoral care, but yet that is what we are called to do. In some respects, Pope Francis is calling the church to look at ministry firstly through the lens of pastoral care. How can we be responsive? And so these are five areas that I'd like us to just think about. Um, first, in terms of mental health. Mental health has come up time and again, and this was very prominent in our studies in the United States, 
about what young adults are going through, that they are experiencing many mental health issues, anxiety, depression, loneliness, um, that mental health is a significant factor in many of them, whether it's clinical uh, or, or elsewise, um, mental health is a major concern. And it takes its form in many different ways. Um, and mental health can be amplified by other uh, external circumstances. Um, so the economy, um, physical health, um, the um, racial injustice can amplify those mental health issues and send them in a tailspin. But mental health is there at the core. This is not to say that that young adults. Um, this is a, this is something that often is not talked about. We don't talk about mental health very much. So it's not something that they'll talk about very frequently. It's something that you can see actually. Um, but it's there. Um, it's very prominent. Economic conditions. These are another area of pastoral concern that we need to be conscious of. We don't often think about uh, economic conditions as something we think about for young adults, but young adults um, are increasingly below the poverty line, and especially as this economic recession, because they will be the, among the generation's hardest hit, young adults will be even further below the poverty line. Um, and, you know, look, crying for help, looking for help. Um, and the church is one of those areas where we, we, we are so good at responding to the economic conditions of many populations. Um, young adults is one of those other populations we need to take into account. Movement and migration. And this is something that many parishes have to keep conscious of because our standard for parishes is often the, uh, the family with the 2.5 kids, white picket fence that's stable in our community and will be there for generations. That is not the reality for young people today. As many of you are aware, um, young adults will often move multiple times before they reach the age of 30. Um, they'll, they'll have different addresses, they'll have different roommates, they'll have different experiences of, of, of in and out. So there's a lot of movement that happens there. And I think that's a, that any type of movement is a transition that causes disruption. And that pastoral, and, and, and that disruption in your life. Um, I mean, you think about jobs, that's part of the movement and migration. The, the, um, the many jobs that young people have also before perhaps they even reach the age of 30, they'll have multiple jobs in their life. Um, and every time, think about it, you're, um, you're, so you're preparing your resume, you're, you're preparing for the job, you get the job, um, you leave the job, you have to then look for the next job. In the midst of that, you've got your, you, you may have to move uh, your house, your apartment, um, so that, that movement is constantly there. Again, with our parish communities, which are so grounded in stability. Stability is what we ground our parish life on. Young adults are incredibly unstable when it comes to that movement. Um, so we have, to, are we necessarily as responsive to that? And then the migration issues in general across the whole country that are happening are taking place. These are areas of pastoral concern. Identity and vocation. Um, young, young adults today are asking, who am I? Where am I going? What is, what am I supposed to do in this life? These are areas of great, a uh, cause of great internal strife that, that we can respond to. Where am I going? What can I do? Um, these are not just general ethical, moral issues. These are, these are pastoral issues that need that response. And then abuse, prejudice, and discrimination. These are areas that young adults, as we've seen, are experiencing directly, um, especially in communities of color, um, but across the board, abuse, Prejudice and discrimination are a reality for many young people. They are feeling, you know, those who um, identify um, as same sex feel a sense of discrimination. You have friends who have a sense of discrimination. They feel that their friends are being discriminated against in one way or another, and that, that um, hurts them as well. So um, these are all areas for us to consider. These are just initial areas. There are many other areas, but these are just five to just get us thinking about the different ways in which young adults are impacted by life today and that we as a church. So what do we do? Um, I propose that there is a methodology of uh, pastoral mobilization. Um, and you're gonna get a little bit of uh, some, some, uh, some military terminology here just to kind of keep the analogy going here. Um, but one of the things is that Pope Francis kind of gives us also a see, judge, act methodology for ministry. Um, so I want to kind of go a little bit deeper as to this methodology. Um, I'm going to go into some detail, so I'm going to jump to the next slide. I know there's a lot of words on here, um, but I'm going to go a little bit depth as to what I mean by see on judging, on acting. How can we mobilize our church to respond 
um, to these young people. So the notion of uh, seeing. Within this first step of seeing, um, the first is checking ourselves and being open to surprises and new discoveries. Um, we have to sometimes uh, recognize that our perception of young adults um, is not necessarily um, always the most familiar one, that, that we, may be, uh, we may center our understanding of young adults based on our, our nieces or nephews, our sons or daughters, our grandchildren, um, the people we surround ourselves with. But that is not, your, your connection to a young adult is not the only uh, young adult that's out there. Um, so be open to the possibility that there are many ways of being a young adult today. Um, and so being open to that reality. Um, one of the things that we, we know about young adults, um, we know that, for instance, only 40% uh, uh, of young adults between the ages of 18 and 25 are in a four-year college. Um, 60, actually, in any college, that's, I should say, 60% um, don't go to have, even they aren't even going to part-time school. So 60% of all young adults between 18 and 25 in this country aren't even in college. That's a surprise to many people. And I just ask that you be open to that um, because I think that that reveals a lot. When you don't have a college education, um, the pastoral issues are different than those with a four-year institutional degree. Um, so, um, so being open to that, allowing, this is, this is the notion of being, letting the Holy Spirit kind of uh, help you better see who the young adults are. Kind of using some military terminology here, check your six or, or observing the terrain or kind of seeing who's behind you in some respects. Look up the key statistics for your local area. Find out in your area, what are some of the, what are the employment numbers? Um, what are, what is the racial and cultural demographics of your local area? Uh, what is the housing market like? What are the, some of the mental and physical health issues in your area? Um, look, at, look at those statistics in your area. And, and, and if you did that like five years ago, when maybe you started working or 10 years ago, look them up all the time, maybe once a year. Keep an eye on what is the what is the issues for your local area, so that because those because the thing is is as as I said, mobility is a key factor with young adults. So if you look these statistics up five years ago at your for your parish, they may have very much changed. So um, observe the terrain that's in your community and constantly keep that in keep that awareness going. Listen, calling. Uh, calling young adults, Zooming with young adults, connecting with family members who are young adults, have a dialogue. Um, I put this website, nationaldialogue.info. Um, that's, that's actually a model of a, a way that you can have a conversation. But just simply listening to what are young adults going through today? Um, are they, um, what are they struggling with most? And not just spiritual or church issues, but what's in their personal lives that they are struggling with? Um, you may have to have a couple of conversations to really have them trust you to have to really be able to explain that. That's why the statistics are helpful because those are often off they are offered in a more uh, generalized way. Um, but you will have to establish some sort of relationship to to have them open up and trust you to be able to share some of those deeper issues. But listen and take the time to listen. And then embed yourself in the community, in their community. Find out what is going on in the area of young adults in your local area. Now you might be saying, I'm a parish uh, DRE, I'm a liturgical director, uh, I'm an associate pastor, um, you know, I don't, I don't do direct young adult ministry. Young adult ministry is kind of a, it, it's kind of a misnomer. It's, it's actually more a ministry with young adults and everyone does that. Everyone does that in some way, shape, or form. We all connect with young adults in their in late teens, 20s, and 30s in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's within um, a particular ministry area. Maybe it's within our own families. Um, think about your own families. That's young adult ministry. If you have a if you have a son or daughter, if you have nieces or nephews, that's part of it. Get to know more those family members. Um, and embed yourself and find how you can learn more about it. So the first step is really being aware um, of their lived realities. The second part, judging. Uh, discern what surprised you. Be conscious of the things that 
what are the things that, um, that, that, that kind of are different than what you expected? Um, I think that's important to keep an eye on because um, it always reminds us what are the things that we're going through that may be different than our, our past experiences. Um, because sometimes when we think about young adults, if we are of a certain age, we might sit there and think, when I was 20 years old, what was I going through? And that's somewhat a good measure to remember. But remember that that might be very different than what young people in 2020 are going through. In fact, I will grant you, when we were, when you were 20, when you were 25, um, if you yourself are past that age now, um, you did not have a pandemic um, that you were dealing with. So everything that a young person today is going through will be different than what you did. So, um, so we can't assume. So, so discerning what, su what surprised you uh, is good because it reminds you that um, young adults are constantly changing, and they're, and you know, and the same young adult on that trajectory as they transition through their young adult years will adapt and grow. Um, ask questions. Ask questions like what do i need to learn more about what are the areas so for instance if you learned that um, mental health is really impacting a lot of the young adults what do you need to learn about mental health what are issues in mental health that you should kind of uh shore up on uh, what are the things that you should probably learn more about um think about that and then who can help me um one of the biggest things that we can remember in ministry with young adults is that we don't have to do it alone and so who are those uh, people? What are those organizations? Uh, the, even if they're within the church or external from the church. So for instance, uh, working with uh, various community centers that work with uh, those with mental health issues might be uh, a, a collaborator in who you can work with. Um, learning about um, if there's issues related to poverty and uh, economic poverty with young adults, are there other um, entities in your local area that can help you better understand that reality, better help you respond to that reality, heck, even help you do the response with the rea to that reality. So think, ask questions about who else needs to be around your table, because you don't have to do it alone. If you sit there and say, you know, if I learn this about young adults, I'm not qualified to respond. Well, you are qualified to listen, and you are qualified to accompany, but there may be some specific situations where no, you're not, and learn though who is around you that can work alongside you in that work. Prioritize pastoral care in your schedule. We prioritize programs, we prioritize catechesis, we prioritize um, events, we prioritize liturgical aspects, but do we always pr pr prioritize pastoral care in our own ministerial schedule? Do we carve out time that says, this is time that I need to do pastoral care work? Whether it's planned or unplanned, um, do we prioritize that in our schedule? Or is reaching out to somebody uh, in pastoral ways the last thing we do? Because it's going to require, like, the, you can do an event that maybe will reach, you know, 100 people, and you're going to spend an hour working on that. And it's tough to justify sometimes spending then an hour for one individual on the phone or on a Zoom call or uh, in an email message or whatever it might be. It's tough for us to justify that. It's easier to spend that hour knowing that this will impact 100 people rather than if it will, if it will impact just one. But I urge you, this is what this calls for. This is what accompaniment means. It means that that one hour for one individual is worth just as much, if not more, than the hour you put in for the 100 people event you're planning. Prioritize that in your schedule. I think that's a key thing for us to remember in this planning for a field hospital. And then prepare and develop a pastoral response operation on the most pressing issues. So there are a few things that you can already pre-plan for. So um, just an example, uh, if, if you learn that uh, unemployment is a major er uh, concern for the young adults in your community, uh, you may consider developing a, um, a job support group, um, uh, a resume building group or something like that, or, or, or planning an event around how to prepare your resume or how to uh, interview well for a job. That might be something, that might be a coordinated pastoral response operation on a very pressing issue you see. Um, it's not an individualized response. It is more of a programmatic response, but you can, in this stage, in the judge stage, you can start to uh, prepare and develop some of those uh, operational 
procedures that you might want to do. Remember, if you think of it, again, this is all thinking of yourself, think of yourself being the MASH unit. Um, you know, what, is, what, what, does a, what does a MASH unit need to respond to those who are injured on the battlefield? And the battlefield is, life is really uh, kicking the rear ends of many of our young adults. They are being hurt, they are being shot at by many things, and in many cases, literally being shot at. So what, how do, how does a MASH unit respond when those, you have to kind of make sure you have all the equipment you need so that when they come in, you are ready to go. That's what the seeing, the judging, the acting is, that you have to have everything ready because when they come, it's gonna be quick, it's gonna be this third, this third step I'm about to get into, it's gonna go quickly. Um, it's gonna be uh, all over the place, it's gonna be a little messy. So making sure that you are have carefully identified your landscape and carefully prepared and discerned is going to be essential to get into that third area. So preparing and developing is part of that. And as I said, the third factor in this is acting. So whatever planned efforts you do have, boldly act upon those. Um, do that with, um, do that, you know, prioritize that in your schedule. Make sure that you are boldly making sure that people know that the church is a place where there can be a response to those, those pastoral issues that are facing young people. You know, you want to make sure that you promote that. Um, that is a great foot forward for you as a parish, as a diocese, as a church, um, to say that we are here to help. So be bold about it. Promote it. Let people know that the church is the place they can go. Because that's one of the things that uh, we learned in the synodal process, is that young people say that um, there are very few places that they feel they can go to to respond to their most pressing issues, the things that are really affecting them. And, they, and the church is not one of those places that they feel is responsive to many of the things they're dealing with in their own lives. Um, there are many other institutions that are also not responding. Um, and so that's why there's been kind of this disaffiliation from all institutions, because institutions by and large do not seem to have that concerted effort to boldly respond to their needs. The church can be one of those places. So by boldly acting upon it, I'm talking about be proud of the fact that you are going to provide a response. But then that's part of the planned efforts. Be available for the unexpected pastoral situation. Just like a mobile mash unit, you have to be nimble and ready to act at a moment's notice. If there is a young adult, and again, I'm not saying there's like a lot of young, if, if a young adult comes to your community and needs support in something and you weren't planned for it, it wasn't on your agenda for the, for the day, it wasn't on your strategic plan, be available and be ready. Make sure that you are prioritizing when people come in for those situations. Don't say, I'll get to you after I get done planning this catechetical program. No, be nimble and ready to act when people have those issues. Because if you're going to boldly put it out there that, that the church is there for them, be ready for young people, young adults to respond and then be ready to act. Continually assess your situation. Um, make sure that um, as you you know, look at your efforts, you know, this is something that goes in any kind of thing, but just continually assess that, um, make the adjustments as needed, and then invest in long-term care. So where, you know, being able to immediately respond like a MASH unit would be to uh, a young person in crisis, um, what, what are areas that you can lead young, young adults towards? Um, are there formation opportunities, spiritual direction, support groups? What are things that can help with the long-term care of that person. Um, because as a minister, you know, and maybe that's part of the planning efforts. You plan for the long-term stuff. You have to nimbly respond when their crisis occurs, but we can't just then throw them back out and say, well, good luck to you. I hope that helps now. We can help guide them through that process. And that's how they learn that the church is a place that they can go for a response to their issues. Um, these are just a couple of ways that we can think about. So some questions for, uh, for your own considerations that um, I ask you to kind of consider. Um, these are things that as you are kind of doing an assessment, even before getting into this, um, what are the pastoral situations do you already see in your local context? What are those things? Think about that. Who are the marginalized? Who are those who are struggling young adults in your community? What who are those people? 
And who's, who do you sometimes, and I made my, my, the interesting thing is by marginalized, they're on the peripheries. They may not be somebody, something you may need to do some true discernment to really answer that. If you notice that your community, if you look at the de demographics of your area and you see, for instance, that um, the demographics, for instance, it's, uh, you know, maybe it's 35% African-American, 20% Hispanic Latino, 15% white, but yet in your ministry, you have 90% white European American that are really engaging with your community. You may need to stop and consider who is missing and how do I uh, discover those marginalized young adults in my community? What are they going through? Um, again, this year we have, especially in the racial context, we've been reminded of those that we have forgotten. Um, we have been, we have forgotten all of them and they are, we are, we are definitely being reminded of it. Who in your context are those marginalized people? That is one of the areas. And oftentimes the marginalization itself, even by the church, is a pastoral issue that you can respond to. And then how does your ministry already respond to the trending emerging pastoral concerns of young adults? Are there areas where you're already doing that good work? Because I don't want to, you know, I'm not, I'm not assuming that, that those on this uh, particular call are um, you know, somehow not doing that work. Um, you probably are already engaged in doing some of that, or your parish is, or your diocese is already responding. What can you build upon? What can you amplify? What can you put forward? And then you can start to think about some creative options of how is your ministry not yet responding? So, but first, is there something you're already doing that you can build upon or amplify? So these are just questions for your consideration. So I wanted to again, paint this picture for you, um, you know, thinking of our ministries with young adults as mobile response units um, really reframes the way we look at it. Um, the other thing about a MASH unit is it goes out to the battlefield. Um, it goes out to in, into the fray of things. Um, uh, hospitals, when we think about the a field hospital is out there in the field. A regular hospital, I guess, would be something you would come to. Um, so how is it that we can be out there and engaged in that world? Um, we can't always expect young people to say, well, I'll come to the church when I need help. Um, no, we need to be a field hospital. That is what Pope Francis is speaking about. How does the church get out of its walls and go out into the field and do that work? So um, also consider that of where your ministry and where that field hospital is taking place. So I'm going to stop there because I know that probably some of you have a number of questions. Um, and so, um, Aaron, if you uh, want to come on and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that have come up for many people. Absolutely. I encourage um, everyone or anyone who has a question to please go ahead and type that in. Um, thank you so much, Paul. I really think that this image is very vivid and something that we can relate to you know this idea of this mobile response unit this field hospital um, and towards the end you started talking about something that actually father tim wrote in um, a question about you know if so many young adults are disaffiliating and they're not coming to church um, yet to reach them they need to be in you know hearing distance how do we how do we reach them? So Pope Francis speaks about this notion of popular ministry, um, and it's going where um, going where the where there is already the activity of the Holy Spirit. Um, this notion of the of disaffiliated, um, uh, I think it, it it often pertains to those who are actually coming to masses to 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 the liturgies on the weekend, but they may already have the Spirit in them as a leader in their communities um, doing some of that 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 you know so are there people who are doing gospel work in their communities the one thing they're missing perhaps is that they aren't in our pews but they are doing the work of what we actually ask people in the pews to be doing those are some those are some first places to go to find those um, and, and what Pope Francis calls popular ministry is going out not popular as in as in you're a popular person, but going out with the, where the people are already on fire with that message. Um, and so, uh, so again, that, that means, again, not going, not, not asking who's, who's here and who's not here. Sometimes just going to the community. Some of it could be, um, uh, part of it is, is, is finding um, people that we already know, um, connections we already have. Um, I think we, 
we were looking for how am I going to find a, a young person who's not active? Chances are you probably know someone in your family. Um, there may be other colleagues and other uh, ministry leaders who know people who are disconnected. Start with them. Start with those individuals. Um, don't try for the holy grail of of you who have no connection to this individual. Try and find a connection that where there's no there's no natural relationship. Find make, start with those with relationships we already have. Um, and build off from there. Um, and then, yeah, seek out, seek out those people who are already active in the world, doing good work in the world, because they are oftentimes, their hearts are already alive with some sort of spiritual calling. So engaging with them there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Maggie asks, what is a good place to start in looking for local community statistics? That's a good question. Um, well, you can find anything by Google. Um, and so, but uh, you know, sometimes it's contacting, uh, or at least looking up um, your, uh, your, your community center, uh, your, your, like, your, like your town hall. Um, many of them keep some records of some, some, some analysis of the communities. Um, there are, um, Couple of government agencies that do um, that do population surveys um, for certain areas and things like that. That might be some place to look. Um, but perhaps again, starting with your civic government, um, they might have um, because many of them, their social service agencies also rely on some of those statistics for the area. So working with that. So you know, looking up, you know, if you have a city or a town, municipal government, a county government, that might be one place to look up. And you know, um, but. Serious, I, I was joking at first about you can Google anything. Um, you can find a lot of statistical information. Um, there may actually be someone else actually on the call who may actually have an idea. So if they put in the chat, they might have. There's some, there are some research places out there, um, but it will depend on each geographic how they do it. Um, I also know some dioceses. You may want to reach out to your diocesan leaders. They may already be doing some of that. So. Um, you might want to reach out to maybe in different offices, not just your young adult office, but um, maybe your uh, office for capital giving might have some of those statistics too, because they, you know, they look at those kind of numbers. Right, right. So. Okay, great. And if anybody has any other input on that question, feel free to type it in. Um, Chris also asks, many mental illness diagnoses, such as schizophrenia, mood disorders, et cetera, are first recognized in the late teens, early 20s. While the church itself is not clinical in nature, how can it support young adults who have identified mental illnesses? No, that's good. Um, well, uh, one way is, first of all, providing a, 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 a making sure that our our ministries, our work is responsive to it in terms of the making sure that we um, are not closed off from those situations, uh, making sure that um, you know they they feel a welcoming atmosphere. So if they do participate, um, preparing yourself how to engage somebody who may have some uh, who who might otherwise seem disruptive or something like that is is engaging with them and making sure they don't feel ostracized when they engage or attend if they do come to church um but also again this is part where the collaboration comes in um are there um are there some clinical places uh in your community in you know in the area that work with those with mental uh mental illnesses that, that you can learn from um i'm a big proponent of collaborating with those organizations that might be in your local area um, i would i would again going back to your civic area environment they might have social services that are engaged work, working with those mental illness you might want to call them up uh, talk with them and find out what are the resources that they find useful in this area and learning from them this is really a part of you know trying to figure out in your local area who has those connections and collaborating with them mm -hmm. Um, let's see, with the sex abuse scandal legacy, the rules for working with youth are stringent. Shouldn't we prepare ourselves for vetting? Um, yes, um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, discern the, the nature of the question. Um, in terms of vetting, um, I'm guessing uh, in reference to 
what does it seem like they're asking in terms of the vetting for perhaps for volunteers working with young adults yeah uh, and well, i would have there's some sort of yeah. um safe environment thing that they have to yeah. complete yeah we have to keep it yeah and that's that is certainly something we have to keep in mind right. we have to make sure that whoever we're working with goes through the you know proper work and we have to make sure you I mean that that's part of the pastoral response um and and you know i think even looking at some of those things that you know are, are there you know, are there situations even where many, some of the young adults are themselves result of abusive situations, whether domestic abuse, whether abuse, verbal abuse in the home, spousal abuse, sexual abuse. Um, so we have to be sensitive. And so I think not only the right do those kinds of uh, vetting processes help regarding our child and youth protection um, regulations in our church, but they are a means to help us better respond, like in a way, uh, child and youth protection is a is one of the forms of pastoral response. How do we protect those who are vulnerable? Um, and young adults are one of those vulnerable populations, especially if they are, are in those uh, precarious realities. So uh, making sure that we're aware of what our uh, vetting processes are um, and making sure that we are vetting ourselves to make sure that we are fully able to protect those um, who are in need of protection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Nora says, I am a young adult myself, 26 years old, and as a young adult coordinator, I try to help others during this time, but it's difficult to connect with uh, other young adults that do not want to talk. How can I reach other young adults in the church that are either introverted or don't want to Zoom or connect? Yeah. Um, you know, part of it is forming, again, forming that relationship. And it doesn't have to be talking about those issues initially. It doesn't have to be talking about church initially. It's forming, I mean, it sounds so simplistic, but forming a simple, re, you know, relationship on issues, on, 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 on anything, really. Um, and, and it's a patient process, especially those who are not, because first of all, they're not other young adults are not going to trust us. Even if we are a young adult ourselves, that doesn't mean they're just going to trust us by the nature of our age. We have to build trust. And that that goes about by forming relationships, getting to know people. Um, and you might spend a whole year just talking about nothing but your favorite movies or sports teams. But that's a slow process to form that relationship so that when they trust you enough, then those deeper issues will come in. We can't expect somebody on the first or second conversation to start telling us what's what's there. Relationships have to be formed. And this is this is probably one of the most agonizing parts about this new paradigm that, that we're given with the field hospital is it's going to take time. Um, this is not gonna be, you know, this I think one of the things that um, I, I in many of my presentations, I often I feel like I leave more people leave disappointed than excited because they know that there's that's this is gonna be a lot of work. This is gonna be a long haul, this is gonna be a slow slow process um but in a sense when you do one by one um accompaniment it is going to be a, a little bit so i know that some people are going to walk away going ah, I, can you i i need to you know like my i need to figure this out by next year or whatever we need to get more people in our pews next weekend or whatever uh, or we need to respond quickly yeah we do but relationships are going to take a while um you know it, it for instance one of the areas that um one of the one of the pastoral areas, for instance, racism. I'll just give you that as an example. Um, those who are persons of color may not be, you know, they, they're not just going to, you know, if a, if a white European American says, "I'm here to help," what trust have you gained? You know, they, there has to be a relationship built before they can unpack for us what are those systemic issues that are impacting them because they don't they don't trust us yet, they don't know us yet, so you know who are those different audiences that we need to say i don't know i need to know but i can't this I, I can't expect to know it overnight and i have to be patient with them and and um and and you know if you are in this for the long haul people will understand that you're not in it just so that you can refill your pews or you're not in it just so that you can you know get a quota of how many people are coming to church that you're in it because you love them and you care for them as a human being. When they when they realize that, 
And for some people, they might realize that after a week of knowing you, other people, it might take years to know you, but it, it will take time. And that's probably one of the hardest things to understand in an accompaniment model is it's not, it's not a quick fix. Um, so um, that's the bad news. Sorry to give bad news, but <laughs> no. I think that though, when you do spend that time accompanying and you building up that trust, even if you're, you know, even if initially they're introverted, they don't feel like talking, slowly just be making sure that people know you're just there. Mm -hmm. it, it, it sounds simplistic, but it does, it will yield those strong results in the end. And maybe shifting the focus or reminding ourselves that it's about individuals, not programs. Yep. Not that I, programs well, are bad, but. No. It's, right. It's, and even, it's not even, it's individuals and not even cohorts. I think sometimes we even, um, so one question that, you know, people have is how do we get those who fill in the blank, either are disaffiliated, those who are, uh, ha, are, are, are uh, have disabilities, those who are on the fringe, how do we get those people, when we think about people in like a block, um, which is kind of like turning on the evening news and them talking about this block of voters or something like that, it doesn't work like that. Um, so when somebody asks me, how do we get uh, the disaffiliated back to church? I say that's you're we're asking the wrong question. How do you have a have a relationship with Tom, with Aaron, with Barbara, with Frank, you know, whoever it might be? How do I have a relationship and how do I accompany that individual? That's the real question. Because when we talk about people as if they are a commodity or a group um, that needs to be like a target market, we're 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 looking at people in the plural. We have to look at people individually. And I think that that goes a much, that's a much stronger way of looking at church. That's a pastoral responsive way of looking. Because again, you don't, when, when you think of, again, think of the analogy of the field hospital. You don't, uh, you, you don't work on all your patients at once. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't, you don't, you don't cure, you know, like, like one doctor doesn't, doesn't like work with every patient in the room simultaneously. Mm -hmm. They work one by one. You don't want someone working, doing heart surgery on you when he's doing heart surgery on 20 people. You want that doctor paying attention to just you. Um, otherwise, he's going to screw up. Um, same thing goes with ministry leaders. We need to be one by one. That's how it works. So, mm -hmm. Great image. Um, and, and maybe this kind of piggybacks on that. Father Tim said, since it takes the village of our parish to raise yeah. our youth, what place does the broader parish community have in this work of triage? That's good. Oh, that's a great question. Well, everyone's got a different, everyone can tackle it from a different perspective. Um, everyone's got a different way of approaching. Um, everyone can have a different type of relationship with somebody too. Um, so we can't, we don't have to be all things to all people. Um, you know, that's why, again, again, I'm, using the imagery does help because it kind of just puts our head around. You know, you have the, you, you have the nurse, you have the doctor, you have uh, the person that's working with your insurance payments, you have, you know, you have all these different people who have different roles in that process. So within the community, it's trying to figure out where do I fit in that? Am I the person, you know, if, am I the person that's going to be the, the, the shoulder to cry on? No, maybe that's not me. Maybe I'm the person um, who's going to plan the programming that for the long-term care stuff. Um, so trying to figure out kind of what everyone's talents and, and, and working in a community to figure that out. Um, you know, I think when it comes to uh, young adults, um, and again, I'm I'm conscious of the word that youth is being used, so I have to be also have to be conscious that we are talking about young adults as well. Youth, this is an issue for youth as well, but there are different factors when it comes to a community working with um, an adolescent versus um, how we deal with a 20-something. Um, and we sometimes think it's, we're, we focus often sometimes so much on the adolescent that we forget that the 25-year-old um, often has very few, the community is not looking at them um, the same way they might look at a 16 year old. Um, and we have to keep that in mind too. Um, young, and that's one of the reasons why many young adults detach is because they see all the love we have for children and youth. And they say, so once I'm 26 years old, once I'm 30 year old, do I, I don't really matter anymore because no one's coming to my aid right away. So we're keeping that in mind too. Um, so yeah, everyone's just got to figure out where they fit in and, and, and working together. You know, maybe in a parish, there is somebody who kind of coordinates an effort. Um, so that way kind of there is some sort of central hub. But um, but yeah, each of us can have a different role in that. Um, the What the usher in the back of church does is, you know, what they can do 
is different than the than the pastor is different than the minister who works in the parish office is different than um, the lady who sits down the pew from people uh, when they come in. So everyone's got a unique way that they would encounter a young adult when they if, if they should come to us. Um, now, in terms of going out into the field in the field hospital, yeah, that it's going it, it, to it, it part of that might also be that um, as people go out into the community and and triage out in the community, um, there may need to be a coordinated effort as to how each of us in our own way can respond. Um, maybe somebody, you know, talking to people who have employees who are young adults, how do you respond to an employee, for instance, uh, or a fellow coworker who's a young adult? What do you, how do you, how do you pastorally minister to somebody in the workplace? Talking to people who are in, um, who are teachers, who are in the community, how do you deal with young adults? How do you work, not deal with, that's a bad word. How do you interact with them? Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe there needs to be a coordinated effort of kind of trying to figure out in the community, how do each in our own workplaces, our own communities, interact with young adults in our own ways? If everyone in the community did that, then yeah, there would be kind of almost a surround sound stereo effect around young adults in that area. Mm -hmm. I, I hear behind this all having a plan, right? Thinking, yeah. thinking through this, um, you know, and, and some of the questions that are coming in are also talking about how COVID obviously has put a wrench into going out into the community, um, you know, to accompany um, yeah. these young people, these young adults. I don't know. But they are, um, one of the things is that they are engaged in some, they are still engaged. Um, and some of the young adults are, they are active and involved, even if it's an online experience. Um, there are still ways that they're connecting in these ways. Um, so yeah, going out doesn't mean physically going out, but but again, going out also means workplaces. Now, if you're if you're working from home, ask yourself. You know, this is kind of one of those weird things. We don't think of doing church at work, um, mm -hmm. but if you think about in if if you have if you if you're working from home, let's just say right now, and there are young adults on your fellow staff that you're in staff meetings with, that you're zooming with. Do we ever think of ministering to our coworkers who are young adults? We often don't. We think they're coworkers. I'm, you know, I don't want to. But how? Can, but this is the challenge. How do you? How, you know, how are we a little more responsive in that environment? So if there's young adults who are within, you know, who are on our Zoom call meetings, staff meetings, perhaps, how are we? How are we talking with them? How are we listening to them? Are there ways in which we can learn a little bit more about them and learn about what they're struggling with and what they're dealing with and ministering to them in that way? So that's going out. It's, it's not going out physically be, out beyond our walls of our house, but it is going out in terms of out beyond the church setting. Um, it's the workplace setting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, are there other things in your community that young adults are connecting with that you maybe in this COVID timeframe are? Um, even um, you know, one one way you, this is such, this may sound so simplistic, this, but but think about the like if you get um, uh, if if you do Peapod or if you do Instacart, chances are your delivery person is a young adult. Mm -hmm. How do you interact with that? Now, of course, with social distance, when they drop off your your groceries at your door, if you're doing the Instacart thing, how do you engage with that person? You know, do you thank them? Do you are you are are you hospitable towards them? Is there a sense of pastoral care? You might sit there and think that's not ministry, but it is. Um, in those little ways, and if everyone again, this the whole the whole notion of the village thing. Mm -hmm. If we did that with our, you know, or the server at our restaurant that is obviously, and think about all the people who are the essential workers. Many of them are young adults who are working in the postal service, who are working the Amazon delivery service. These are people who are many of them are young adults. Um, they're on the front lines, and that's why a third of them are really susceptible to these COVID right. symptoms because they're faced with this every day. Right. How are we, you know, one thing I, I've been, you know, I was in Costco uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and, and um, in this COVID time, people's tensions are very high. They're very high right now. Um, and how many, I'm, how many times I've been at the checkout counter and talked to the young adult who's behind the checkout counter, behind the glass, of course, um, and talked to them. And, and they said, and when I wished them, I, I, was, I was just having a conversation. How are you doing today? How are you holding up? And they said, that's the nicest thing someone said to me all day. I just keep getting yelled at. 
Mm. You know, um, and this is what many of these, this is where some of those mental health issues are coming from because this anxiety that they're constantly, they're, they're, they're having to go to work, meeting people all day, feeling these COVID symptoms kind of swirling about them. And what is the thanks they get from many people is they be yelled at. How can we be patient with those people? That will go a long way. So those are, I mean, again, it's, it doesn't sound churchy, but that's, in, that's, that's, that's being in the field with these young adults um, who are on the front lines of this, of this crisis. Um, and that, that little, that little bit there goes a long way. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Just some, I know it's, it's almost like a course in how to be just nice to people. I know it right, sounds right. like, <laughs> but I think we've lost that. We've been so focused on how do we, you know, these other aspects of church that we sometimes the human aspect is the one we lose the, the most. Mm-hmm. And in the synodal process with Pope Francis, that was the thing that we heard time and time again, church people, th- this, this authenticity gap was noticed that church people want to talk about church but they don't want to talk to me as a human being. They don't want to talk about my real life issues. Mm-hmm. Um, they, all they want to talk about is the moral issues or they want to talk about the liturgical issues or the theological issues. They don't want to talk about the human issues. And that's where I'm, this is where as a young adult, I'm very focused on the human. I'm figuring out what life is all about. And that's the one place where I don't feel much love and connection from, from church people. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it's, it's sometimes, it, I know it sounds simple, being a human being, being a kind person, hearted human being it's amazing what amazing what we can do with that and how that's an evangelization tool right love your neighbor (laughs) definitely yeah well paul thank you so much (laughs) yes thank you so much for um sharing this time with us and really breaking down this whole image of a field hospital to our practical lives that we could apply you know in, in everything that we do thank you so much Um, I wanted to, again, remind everybody that this has been recorded, and I will send you a link to that recording tomorrow via email. Um, And we encourage you, um, as always, let let me step back, as always, we want to offer you a discount. So you can use webinar code, webinar0728 for today's date, 25% off your order. And um, it's pretty much everything. There's a few exclusions um, at AveMariaPress.com. These are some great books here. Um, Talking about truth, having conversations with people. Um, This by Ann Garrido. This is an excellent book. Um, How to deal with some hot topic issues, what to say and how to say it by Brandon Vaught. And I think I'm probably speaking to an audience of JP2 lovers, right? And so this is a newly discovered um, manuscript or or, um, speech that he wrote. Um, teachings for an unbelieving world. So thank you all for joining us today and not next week, but the following Tuesday, August 11th, um, Susan Mudo and Lori McMahon are going to explore fundamental themes of Franciscan spirituality, leading us to a deeper understanding of how we are called to full participation in Christ, embracing a life of suffering, joy, and compassion. Thank you all again. Thank you, Paul. Everybody have a great day and see you next time. Bye-bye.